think it's working now. <laughs> okay, so tonight uh, I've got some reference pulled up, and um, I can pull that over so that uh, you can have a look at that before we um, before we get started. And it's this right here. So I have these uh, artifacts. Uh, from Central and South America, I believe. Uh, that one is interesting. I wrote India on there just because it has a... I mean, I'm almost sure this is a... This is South or Central American thing, just based on the styling. But um, there's some interesting elements that... Um, that cross over with uh, Indian art. Um... I can't remember the character's name, but he's the he's the uh, blue monkey. He's like the faithful sidekick of um, uh, of uh, not Vishnu. Um, sorry, spacing out, losing my uh, losing my um, memory of the. Hindu deities, but uh, yeah, we're gonna pick some of these and uh, get sketching. You can see I've done some of these before. This one, this one right here, um, and there's another one here I've done. This guy right there. Um, so we're gonna dive in on some of these. That's a fun one. Lots of color going on there. All right, I'm gonna move that back over to the other screen. I'm just going to double check to make sure that uh, the stream is in fact healthy and working. Um, and then... Uh, we'll go from there. Okay, let's jump right into it. I'm going to start with... Just a brush for sketching. We'll do, you know, one of my favorites for sketching is this uh, Nasty Square Standard that I have in my uh, painterly brush set. And uh, this one is good uh, for a block in. So, as the name describes, it is a little bit nasty. But um, all of that kind of loose texture there is going to be nice uh, later on. At least that is. That's the plan. All right, so we're blocking in the form of this thing. And I'm just going to use as large a brush as possible to get it uh, blocked in. And that's going to help us get nice, smooth, um, smooth arcs and consistent shapes um, rather than uh, trying to get in there with all these very small, detailed um, detailed uh, line drawings too early so I can already see looking at this how I need to adjust it uh, in terms of the proportion with the source image so I'm just gonna go ahead and do that right now some of that I can just do with uh, the deformation tool and uh, some of it I'm gonna have to do um, by repainting it but you see how quick that block in was and now we can come in and start to define some of these shapes here and then you erase away and the eraser is um, quite gritty almost you know I talked about the block in being kind of messy the erasers quite messy too um, and 
it's all intentional to get uh, to get a really textural block in. This can give us a lot of free information uh, to work from. All right, so I'm just working on the proportions to make sure I'm accurate here to my uh, to my reference. I'm going to swap between black and white to uh, really quickly get these areas worked out here. This is a really fun um, image to work from. The uh, you know already I'm seeing kind of these stylistic. Uh, choices that they've um, incorporated into the well I guess that, that make up the um, the art style of that culture and age um, you see this kind of back and forth between these uh, blocks and these circles right? really kind of basic shapes here they're playing with um, but then they repeat as you go down the form. So you get these really hard, you know, linear shapes here, and you've got these um, circles that are symmetrical on either side. Just an interesting, interesting thing to see. face in here and we're going to go across there do, 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 do. I always love that opportunity in a drawing to um, put in these little hash marks that uh, they give you cues for space how far apart items are um, if you have any perspective on it, um, that's a really nice a little cue right there. Okay, these things are symmetrical and they are uh, kind of receding in space. So, you know, okay, I can see where the form leads. So, I always like that opportunity to, to exploit these repetition uh, what do you know how is this term the first time I remember hearing this uh, and really grasping it it was uh, associated shapes was the term that was used uh, the shapes that are associated with each other and they show up in different places on the drawing uh, and that's going to tell you um, where they well, it's going to give you information. That information could be where they are in the scene. It could be uh, just a reference in the design, right? Like a motif. Uh, and that's something we're seeing here, right? These, these shapes that are symmetrical are going to be... Um, they're going to be the same size. So you can see that we're looking at this thing straight on. But then, uh, you know, they vary the sizes as it, as it kind of moves down the form. There's actually more down here as we get down to it. But for now, I'm going to block in these. Again, right here, you know, we're doing these little feather uh, forms here. Doing the same thing where having this repetition of shape um, and that uh, gives the eye something to follow around that curvature there right so we didn't actually draw a curve there we drew these you know radiating out and um, as far as the design goes it leads the eye around that curve and of course 
this is not our design. We are, uh, we are copying something from history. Uh, but we can make those observations and learn from them. Okay. Man, I can't imagine living in these times when these things were created. Uh, but seeing them now, uh, I just think they're amazing. I just I can't get enough of them. I can imagine they might have been um, they might have been rather horrifying at the time. You know, it all depends, I suppose, on what they symbolize. You know, whether it's the uh, deity you're supposed to be afraid of, or the deity you're supposed to uh, love and respect and hope for. Uh, good crops or something, you know, uh, or maybe a little bit of both, a little of column A, a little of column B, as my friend Charles would say, all right, let's see, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds with this, because I'm starting to detail up here, but I've still got a lot down here to, to, to work with, so, um, let's see, we've got those wing shapes here and then they have like a flare out wing shape which is kind of interesting the form kind of reverses there and I'm just going to do a layer underneath here and get this like that um, okay, and merge those down alright so now we want to erase out that portion underneath here and this is one of the nice things with these brushes. Um, you can use them different ways. So you can see there, this is a flat brush. But if I just uh, push and spin in place, then you get a nice uh, circle shape like that. I don't mean to always be uh, you know, pushing my brushes on people, but uh, I do want to let you know that that is the way the tools work, and that's the way they're designed. Um, and it's intentional and useful. So, if you're wondering what that's all about, that is what that is all about. Okay, so we're going to go back to the uh, brush tool. Get these uh, these shapes back in there. I don't know if I want to go with you know what I did with the eraser there, or if I want to get it more true to. Um, the original. I'm going to kind of leave it like that. I like, kind of like that stylization, um, even though I'm, you know, looking to this uh, piece of work to learn from it. Uh, I also am attempting to make this a engaging drawing uh, in its own, uh, you know, in its own power. And that is a matter of making some of these decisions on how to portray something, what to admit, and what to uh, what to keep in there. Okay, see, same thing here. Even though I've got a square brush, I'm uh, you know just dabbing it around in a circle. See if we can get a interesting pattern going on there. And these are actually a little bit larger. So we'll start that over. And we'll check our alignment too. They Here and 
keep working our way in. Okay, and then there's this really uh, interesting portion here. I'm assuming that this represents a door uh, to a home or to some kind of a building. That's usually where doors are, right, in buildings. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's got like this, looks like a little portal there. And then there's a bowl here. I need to talk to a historian who uh, can tell me all about these things. That would be, you know, I talked about this last time I was doing this theme, uh, but it's still true, you know, like these are uh, just interesting works in I'm sure that there is information on them, uh, more information than than I'm working from. I'm sure. So, okay. Now we're going to come back. This guy. Let's get like these little arms or hands or something that are coming up and holding that form as it changes. these patterns all over it, which are pretty interesting. So you've got these, well, hold on, let me get the uh, edge of this form in first. There we go. Now the patterns are um, these little dots. Do, do, do. A little bit bigger than that, so I'm going to back up. And I'm just going to let them be squares because I'm reckless and irresponsible like that. Okay. Soften that up just a little bit so it's not such a hard, uh, hard weight uh, edge there. here. Okay, so we've got uh, a black and white block in of our uh, subject here. Now we can start noodling with some of these uh, other design elements. It's just covered with um, decoration, ornamentation. Which I think is pretty awesome. 
obviously sometimes you can go too far with too much decoration and so forth, but um, it's neat when you see it uh, in these certain art forms that uh, did it really well. And there's like these teeth here. Do, 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 do. And there's like a. Looks almost like a lion, you know, or like cat's mouth kind of thing there. Nope, this comes like that. These have some interesting bright rims on them. I'm not sure what this patterning is on the, you know, it looks like there's like a tongue coming out or something. And then there's this like bumpy texture. I wonder if that's just supposed to be taste buds. These guys are really hungry deities, you know, like just get mega taste buds, you know. Alright. This is why I could never work in a museum. They wouldn't have me. You know? Let's see this guy. All of his comments about wonderful works of art. I think people would enjoy these more if he could just shut his mouth. But he can't. Okay. So, I don't want to get too uh, bright all over the place here. Because we're going to come back and uh, balance these colors out. Because um, you can, it's obvious it's pretty harsh black and white. Um, and the gray tones are, are not that subtle. At least not, not yet. Uh, so when we come to color, we will have to figure that out because. As I've said many times before, uh, color has a uh, intrinsic uh, relationship with value. Uh, so you can't just go throwing any old color or any old value at this and then expect it to easily transition into an accurate color. You've got to get them in the right zones. And that would be a little brighter for yellows. A little bit darker for reds, blues, certainly. Um, you can kind of see it on the wheel here. If you squint, you can see, okay, that's kind of dark, that's kind of dark. That's that's really bright, that teal, cyan right there. Yellow's really, really bright. So there's a natural, uh, there's a natural um, value, color, um, brightness value to, to uh, individual hues if you want them to be fully saturated. Hmm. Okay. Now these are a little bit off. These circles are supposed to be higher. Question is, am I going to fix it? The nice thing with digital is that it's not too late. We could fix that. Uh, I guess I've said it, now I have to do it. So we'll go to our ellipse 
tool, hold Alt to center it, and we can move that right there. And we will move this to where it belongs, right there. And then we're going to do the same thing over here. Grab that guy, move V, and move that to where it actually is in the, well, sort of, it's sort of there. Might be averaging a little bit here. Right, so now we're going to paint back in that area that we lost. And uh, I'm actually going to cut out this area because it's a nice pass through on the subject. Cut that out. Cut this over here. Move that. Cut that out. Now we're cooking. Okay, so we've got this set up. From here we could add color. Normally I jump right into color, um, but it is nice to just deal with value. Now I could, I should probably work on the subtleties of this in terms of um, in terms of value light and dark. Um, I can jump into the color first and then correct the value um, in order to meet the needs of the hue that I'm dealing with or um, we can get a really nice looking grayscale image before we get into color. I'm gonna do uh, what I mentioned at first there. I'm gonna just throw in some value or throw in some hue and then when we get to um, when we get to uh, a point where we're happy with the the color block in, then we can come back and adjust the value to allow the colors to sing. Though, as I'm painting over this, I do kind of just like the the opaque nature of what I'm laying down here. It just feels kind of nice. You know, like actually painting, rather than planning to come back and use this as a uh, as a color overlay or something. You know, I do uh, typically prefer to uh, just go direct, even in Photoshop, just direct to the color and value that I want. Um, though, I think it would be a good idea for me to start returning to some um, uh, value studies, uh, just because I've noticed this in my work that I will get really punchy, like really bright colors, um, really bright contrast, you know, lights and darks, and um, as much as I like that and I, I enjoy the results of that work and I'm comfortable with that, um, I think it would be good to push out of my comfort zone and, uh, you know, deal in a totally grayscale um, mode because because I enjoy color and how I utilize it, um, it makes it, I don't want to call it a crutch, but I mean, in truth, it kind of is. All right, I shouldn't admit that. Sorry. I've been, I'm admitting my faults. We're supposed to be here to be painting and uh, being all happy and positive and all that kind of stuff.
there's no time for honest introspection when you have to be positive but this is not Bob Ross so that is not what you're going to get all right, so we're getting some of the, obviously, the reds in here. Um, and sooner than later, I can show you what I mean about the, uh, the color relationship. As I can switch these layers over. Let me just get this in there. And where else do we have some nice reds? We got some red down here. And here. And there's some red orange down here like uh, that's probably like a natural clay slip or something of course all of these are probably natural clay slips because that's what it is <laughs> all right and I'm gonna shift this I, I see this is actually a little more um, deeper orange yellow there on these ones in the uh, in the reference and a little bit of a deeper yellow orange here there and there okay okay I guess we can jump there's a little bit of green in there may as well do it before we jump into that into that next step. It's uh, desaturated. That looks about right, right there. And there's some green in here. Might be a little darker. And there. And around the edges of these uh, rings here. And this guy here. There. And around these areas. Inside this uh, area that seems to be around this character's mouth, and uh, we'll have to kind of draw that out a little more as we go. Get that uh, um, get that these faces to really start popping out, and then I uh, just missed one little area up here. This is much more orange than it is uh, yellow Did miss anything else we good we got it a little bit of that in there a little bit of orange here and these have got an interesting hue here an off like a green yellow ochre kind of like a nasty green olive dread something like that kind of and there's little bits and bobs of green down here okay so I'm going to duplicate this layer I take the original and we'll go to color now you can see what I'm saying how you know we have these colors here and if we let the light and darkness value here control um, uh, control the uh, value the lightness then you can see how we lose the uh, richness of a lot of those colors so if I'm under this layer, and I'm just going to go to uh, like an airbrush, uh, if I can find it. It's buried in here somewhere. Okay. And I go to a middle gray. And I'm just going to start working this in. And you can see how it allows those colors to come back in. Now, if you're looking here, it should be somewhat obvious why you kind of have to be in the mid-tone to get the 
um, the richest color. Um, and like I was saying, for yellows, that's uh, quite a bit brighter. And for blues and reds, it, that can be a little bit darker. Okay, so this is one way we can do it. We can come in with this mid value and uh, work that in there. But we can also uh, we can also approach it a couple different ways. This is uh, why I was saying earlier that I prefer to uh, just jump in with the color, um, you know, and paint. Uh, directly rather than kind of work up these layers like this um, it's just uh, it's more predictable though when you're doing this if you're doing this with um, oil like in traditional media you know some of these concepts still hold true like if you wanted to get a, a nice rich um, blue or a nice rich yellow you know something that uh, has some uh, kind of luminescence to it then you would have to put uh, like a white base under it. You, know, you can't just go thickly. You would have to kind of allow light to come through the pigment, bounce off that white, and bounce back. You know, in order to, kind of, in a way, backlight the uh, backlight the pigment on the canvas. So there are methods uh, like that that um, do employ similar concepts of. You know, how to build things up in value and then come back over with color. Um, so you can see adding in some of these midtones here um, gives us some space for these colors to come in. Now, one thing I'm going to um, thing that we could do rather than um, setting it to a color layer is we, we can come in here, we'll do the blend if option. So if it's black, um, we'll omit it and if it's white we can omit it as well um, and you can blend these by you, know, you hold all and then you pull this over that'll let you blend that uh, um, blend that value range right there and that helps us preserve the drawing underneath and all that texture that we worked on. Now we're going to do a little bit of a little bit of both here. Until we get ourselves relatively close. I'm going to go with a uh, multiply layer. I think that's what I want. Debating it now, now that I'm looking at it. Um, yeah, we'll just brush it in and we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to grab all this, um, hit Control G to group it, and then I'm going to hold Alt and pin this uh, shadow layer to that group. One minute, I'm going to take a sip of my tea here. All right, so now that I have um, pinned this to the, the group, it's only going to affect that uh, that stack below it. Oh, I see in the chat, got uh, Smack R is here. Welcome back. Thanks for joining back in. You got a painting up tonight. If we need to, it might be a good idea to um, share the uh, reference board. I'm using a program called Pure Ref. Um, let me pull that back over. Show you. So, this is the uh, reference image. But all this program is called Pure Ref. All it is is you you just drop image in, drop images into it, and you can like leave notes and stuff. Um, and then. Uh, you can save off these files so I could package this up and send it out so you know once I get myself a little more organized on these live streams it would be kind of a cool idea to 
you know have the community um, have, a, have a community page where um, you can grab the reference file that we'll be working from. Then we could paint the same thing. Speaking of which, um, see uh, Bobby Chu's been doing that in his um, Chu stream. They've been doing a what do they call that? 90, 90 minute art challenge, and um, they will send out a reference image uh, in a like a newsletter email. Um, I think it's usually like an hour before they start, and then. Um, they do a live stream and you know people paint along with the same subject I think that's a really cool uh, it's a really cool idea and a simple way to do it too you know it's just you got a link here's the image in your email here's the link to the uh, to the stream and away you go though I will I will say honestly I had not been approaching this um, with that kind of foresight. I mean, that's obvious. Um, but, uh, you know, the point of these live streams, and I, I know I say this until I'm blue in the face, um, but I, I started these really for myself to get into this practice and this discipline of just doing this consistently and also doing things that... Um, didn't require um, this time crunch of uh, the time crunch and the uh, financial incentive of uh, you know, I got to get this done for the client kind of thing, um, and all that's fine. Like that's a that's a that's a, it's good to learn how to to work under pressure, but then it's really nice to uh, to not work under pressure. I I I actually like. As weird as it sounds, it's like I, I kind of had to learn how to do that as well. Um, that like, okay, there's no deadline on this. I'm just doing this for the joy of uh, painting. Uh-oh, use that phrase, channeling the Bob Ross in me. But, um, you know, just for, the, just for the sake of doing it. And um, I think when you do that, you're, gonna, you're going to approach... Um, you're going to approach the subjects differently and you're going to approach the, uh, the methodology differently. And so I appreciate that. I, I, uh, I'm a big proponent of, um, kind of a cross training approach to art. Um, you know, do what interests you and do a broad spectrum of things. And these different disciplines inform each other. You know, if you're doing 3d, that's going to inform your, your 2D work and, uh, and vice versa. If you're doing animation, animation informs painting and, uh, and 3D. You know, you'll have much more interesting um, uh, gestures and a sense of motion in your work when um, you study motion as a discipline. And uh, in a way, I'm cursed to be uh, interested in a lot of things and a master of none. But I also feel like that has been um, a blessing, a, a benefit for me. And that you can, you can kind of see how things relate and connect the dots. And there's a, there's a lot of value in connecting the dots between different disciplines. And I would encourage anybody who's, you know, if you're an artist or aspiring artist and you have other work, other things in your life, figure out how, how to leverage those things uh, to learn from them. I mean, I remember working at, uh, at uh, Sikorsky. Um, I was working on um, helicopters. And a lot of what we did there was well we modified um, modified the helicopters and so we'd have to tear them down and take the engines out all that kind of stuff and uh, we'd put in 
different antennas or something like that. Um, a hoist, you know, different different kinds of uh, outfits for the helicopters. But anyway, um, in that job, it's like I can't tell you how many times I drew the engines. <laughs> you know, uh, not at work, but you know, maybe throw a little sketch in a in your little notebook at work, and then at home. Uh, flesh it out a, a bit more, you know, or, uh, you know, just seeing how things work and how, um, you know, mechanically the parts go together, um, you know, those sort of things are really beneficial to, uh, to my understanding of, um, uh, concept there, like a mechanic type uh, mechanical parts. Uh, turns out there is some benefit to the real world. Just saying. Just throwing that out there. And so, not every, um, you know, not every other part of life is a, like a non- art thing, like it's not moving you forward. And that's basically all I'm saying there is that you can leverage a lot of things that you have in your in your life to, to learn something or to apply it to uh, apply it to some other discipline. It was one of those things I remember doing at Sikorsky was um, so I had this little uh, I'm wanting to call it a sketchbook. It's not a sketchbook. A notepad. That's what they call those. You know, real people in the real world. I had a notepad. And uh, I would take all my notes for my work on the, on the front side of it. And then on the back pages, I would basically take notes on all of the things that seemed broken to me in terms of... Uh, how the business operated, how manufacturing operated. Um, and I thought, you know, if I ever do my own work, you know, even just my contracting uh, uh, business at home, uh, by contracting, I mean freelance artwork, um, then I wonder if I would make some of these same mistakes just because you know, once you get going, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to fight against the momentum. Um, and, uh, turns out that was actually pretty useful, like a useful exercise to look at, like, the business I'm working for, this is how it works, this is, uh, some of the problems that it has, and if, and if it were my responsibility, how would I how would I address this, or could I even address this? You know, um, I think in many cases I became more sympathetic to why things were messed up. <laughs> you know, like oh, okay, that actually kind of makes sense. It's a, you know, especially there is like you have a, a thousand employees, you know, at this factory, then if uh, if everyone's allowed to make one mistake a month. That's a thousand mistakes a month, right? So, uh, you know, no wonder, no wonder crazy things happen, right? Um, so, anyway, that was an exercise and trying to figure out, okay, so for myself and my own work, um, how do I kind of leverage this to keep an eye out for uh, potential pitfalls and maybe things I could do better? Okay, so I've blocked in, um, I've blocked in the uh, light down here. You know, just our black and white. We did a little bit of a color uh, pass on it, uh, letting the blacks and whites come through so that we didn't lose all that texture. And then, and we might actually, we could bring that down a little bit if we wanted to save any more of that texture. Um, but then uh, we did the luminosity on the on this gray layer, and maybe we'll bump that back and forth. I don't know. 
I don't know what I think about that. That may or may not be helping. Uh, but then we've got another color layer here. I'm sorry, that original was uh, normal. That's We have color on a normal layer down here. And then color on a color layer. So it's going to ignore the brightness of, um, of its own uh, um, layer values there. And then uh, up here we have our shadow layer. This is uh, multiply. And then I've just started painting on a, a base. Um, you know, this is just going to be a, a normal, um, we'll call this a paint over. <laughs> We're basically just adding another layer of paint here and this is where I want to start getting close to those final values we might you know do uh, we might do an overlay or something like that but um, we want to make sure that at this stage we're we're building out the actual uh, you know, the actual final image And, you know, what we've done plenty to give ourselves information on uh, what to do from here. So we've got all this, like, fluting here, so it's really easy to, you know, grab a little value and um, push it between those lines and show that that kind of curves on that form there. Um, I'm going to just jump back and forth between colors here. So I'm going to bring this in like that, kind of knock that black out so that it's not completely, uh, you know, void of color in those cavities there. And we might brighten up to the ends of this. Uh, Those are nice and clean. And they also have fluting, right? Uh, I'm debating whether to do these rings. There's always rings around the eyes and these circles here. You know, they, they, uh, there's at least two, one, two, three. So there's three. It's like this, and this guy, and this guy. Right? And uh, I think I should probably do these on another layer um, so that I can have a little more control over there. I'll come back to that. If you remind me, I'll probably forget. And then I'll get finished with this stream and go, oh yeah, I said I was going to do that. And I didn't. But. You guys know what you signed up for when you came to the stream. At least I hope so. Because if you didn't, then that's it. You signed up for somebody saying things and then forgetting that he was going to do that. And then, uh, like, oh yeah. Okay. Now we do need to vary our tones here a bit or else we're going to flatten it out if I keep working with that same same color there but the nice thing is, is that we've we've blocked in a bunch here and so there's a, a lot of opportunity to pick up um, pick up the colors that we've laid down and then blend them right? so we don't have to be entirely uh, beholden to you know just picking one thing and going with it right so, like in here, I can see that these these tones that is a much more kind of a dark, um, even a little rich, maybe a little a little bit of red in that uh, shadow there. So we're not actually going with uh, black shadows in that in that uh, yellow um, that yellow field of color there. Same thing here. These could be a little richer. 
and that actually is something you know we typically come back and do like an overlay uh, over the uh, painting and that is something that is a, a function that that would serve is to warm up those shadows if we wanted to do that we are increasing the uh, perceived complexity of these little forms down here. These have all these little you know, wedges and so forth cut out of them. Really intricate, cool little uh, areas on this uh, on this reference. Get too tight, too stuck, you know. Uh, I'm trying to get this uh, tightly rendered or whatever. I think one of the nice attributes of it is that it actually is quite um, loose, you know, textural. So we don't want to get too far afield from that. back to this section. And there's more red in here. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the chat, and I will answer rather than just uh, monologuing. I mean, I guess it's going to be a monologue anyway, because that's how YouTube Live works, but it uh, feels less like it if I'm answering questions rather than just... Uh, saying whatever comes to mind. You can see at this stage there is uh, a fair bit of overlap, so we're kind of drawing over the things that we drew bef before, and uh, we're kind of pushing a little further the um, visual clarity of what areas are in front of others, right? Um, just the, you know, if we take this up here, I mean, this in our reference is actually uh, not quite in front of that, uh, in front of this region here. But of course we can, we can push that, so if we push it up, you know, move this over here and we're creating this overlap to show um, a little more space here right? so push all that back darken that up and we can build in the shadows to have this you know, ca this is casting a shadow here and that's going to be Frankly, one of the, the best way to show that you've uh, you've got a form, an overlapping form, is to have a cast shadow and to um, bring that in and out, like you're deciding where it um, uh, where it terminates. And often, uh, just because this is uh, I don't know, just by the nature of things. Um, You'll see these wedges, these like triangle shapes, you know, because it, if this comes up here and this is where it connects, 
and that's going to be your thinnest, you know, that's going to be your point, and then if it's pulling away from that form, then you'll have a, a triangle, right? So, easy way to uh, remember how to kind of deal with shapes like that. Same thing here, you know, kind of that overlap there so that these will pop forward. And we're just arranging the arranging the space, if you will. Or even if you won't, it's still what we're doing. Let's see these. Actually, kind of like this, um, like how that's kind of cutting away there. You know, getting the the, the, the texture of that where it's worn. I like that. I don't want to lose that. Oh yeah, somebody said he was going to do circles on these things. Somebody said that. Let's do it. I'll even name the layer circles. Okay. And I suppose I could just do this with a ellipse tool so that they're cleaner. Uh, but not entirely with the ellipse tool. I want to uh, invert that selection and then. Um, paint outside of it like this. So it's going to help guide me. Uh, obviously it's going to mask that inside, but um, I uh, want the brush uh, strokes to come through like that. And then once we've got one, um, we can just kind of work off of that. And that'll give it a more natural look because we'll actually be, you know, freehanding these other ones. With digital, you can do so much um, with aid, and uh, that, you know, obviously that can be a very effective way to work because um, you can get a lot done quickly, or you can get the precision that you couldn't otherwise get. Um, but uh, I still find it's nice to actually just paint things. You know, it's part of the process. And especially since this is not a, um, this is not a commission or anything, you know, we've got time, we've got time to do it. Says the guy who's uh, duplicating the layer and moving it over. Okay, we're going to do the same thing with these other ones here. And, you know, I didn't need to invert that selection. I could do it from the outside. Uh, you know, so the clean line is going to be on the in uh, outside and the uh, rough edge is going to be on the inside here. Again, I'm working on the palette here rather than 
entirely color picking is you're going to add more nuance and color shifts and so forth that are important. You end up with too much of the same thing if you're just you know working from one color and applying it everywhere. Should be obvious, but you don't get the the free uh, any kind of free texture that you would with a uh, or a free uh, you know, hue shifts and uh, nice color blends that you would with uh, traditional. Even then, you have to plan for it, but um, you know there's a little bit of natural color play between pigments. Uh, that you don't get digitally unless you plan for that as well. Okay, there's a darker value inside of that. It's got like an edge to it. Let's see. You gotta stick to the circles, Eric. Starting to get distracted. Go off to other things. But we're here for the circles. Don't lose sight. We'll go a little larger with that. Let's see, we need, yeah, it's kind of a tan color there. And what I really should be doing, I shouldn't be working so small, I should get right in there, get a nice smooth arc, right? Use your elbow. Says the man who is not using his elbow right now. A nice, you get a smoother transition that way for using your elbow and shoulder with smoother arcs. There is some uh, overlap here where this, this comes up in front, like that. So grab that, and these elements. Let's see, this goes here. And I think these actually uh, recede in space as well. So I need to uh, I need to show that. So I'm gonna, gonna bring this value, this bright brightness forward here, and then, uh, and then we're gonna cast a shadow right on this area right here. Okay, and we need to get that closer to orange there. 
burger. cooking and this can come down in value here that's a that's quite the look there very very handsome style So then we're gonna, whoops, that's too much. Um, let's grab a value. We want a little bit of color in there. And look over here. And then we're gonna cast this shadow here. Again, with that uh, wedge idea, right? Do a little wedge there. Softly blend that there. Very good look, sir. All of the other deities are jealous. Again, this is why I can't work at the museum. They wouldn't like these comments. Very impressive taste buds. And I suppose we can work in some of the color in here. It's actually more of a red orange going on there in the reference. Um, this is actually brighter here. This has got a nice rich uh, yellow interior to it. And it's got like an uh, like a well, either a worn edge or uh, either way, it's a, a brighter, softer value on the outside there. And we need some bits, little fiddly bits there. All of these have these uh, this off-white kind of point on the end here. those arrows like, uh, as an arrow heads supposed to be aggressive or something hmm interesting let's see these are almost like tassels they're pretty clearly sculpted in the clay, but I'm okay with depicting them as, you know, actual tassels. And I really should be, you know, doing more draw through with this. And what I mean by that is you, you just, you could just do one stroke, you know, I was kind of going in between all these things, but you really could have just done one stroke there and then maybe erased away, but I didn't need uh, a lot more efficient and a lot more um, uh, carry through in terms of um, 
you know, your eye can follow that along. Whereas if there's breaks in it and it doesn't perfectly line up, your eye, your eye can catch that stuff and get a little fussy about it. You know, that's not real. That's not right. I don't like that. The artist didn't work hard enough. You know, that's usually what your eye is telling you. Work harder, work faster. My friend was telling me he uh, he worked at a uh, for a uh, concrete business for a while, and uh, he was doing a job. And this the uh, place where they were working, the uh, clients, uh, little kid, like three years old, you know came out and was kind of like playing in the mud next to him. He was pretending that he was, uh, you know, leveling out the concrete or, you know, whatever my friend was doing. And, uh, and he hears him saying something under his breath. And so he, he gets close enough to where he can hear what he's saying. And that's, that's what he's saying. He's going, work harder, work faster. Oh man, three years old, already a slave driver. Terrible. Oh man, I'm spending a lot more time on this than I originally thought that I would. I thought that I'd be like, and we'll just throw throw together a little sketch and move on to the next thing. And that honestly is how I feel on a lot of these. And then I just get sucked into it. Like I said, you know, no time constraints. You just you just going. And uh, and it's just for the sake of doing it. It's just fun. Um, but yeah, then you do get stuck on these like oh. Yeah, I'm still doing that thing that I was only going to do for a minute. But I am really enjoying this uh, particular piece. I think this is just it's such a cool... I just love this topic. It's just so interesting to me to see these old you know, these pieces of history. And uh, they're... They're amazing in on many different levels. Um, just their the craftsmanship, the artwork, the culture, you know, the, the history of the the individual piece, like how how did this thing survive um, to today to you know, now we have it we can look at it and appreciate it. Maybe learn and know some things about it, and and who do we have to uh, who do we have to thank for preserving that history? You know, all that kind of stuff. Like, there's just so much there. It's it's just, it's just interesting. Good talk, Eric. That could be summed up as, I just like things. They're just neat. Things are neat. Now, obviously, there's a there's a lot of history and significance to these things. And I just think that's cool. Okay. in terminate these forms here there's some really deep reds going on down in here which is kind of neat you get some of that back in there from the reference we really have not worked on the bottom of the image much um, and that's okay to you know focus on one area or rather 
have a focal point in the image that is uh, more important than the others and leave some other things a little bit uh, um, less developed it helps lead the eye uh, but in this case that wasn't necessarily the plan I just did that because uh, because I found other things more interesting at the time oh and this is the circles layer I'm supposed to be making circles on this layer we'll do circles and more oh yeah we gotta get back to back to the circle business okay one moment <coughs> excuse me some some of this color here on the edge and we'll do another layer of that uh, just inside again you know very uh, consistent motif across this uh, across this sculptural piece the way they handled this and painted it I mean, there's an obvious uh, uh, there's an obvious um, kind of form that they're following in, in terms of I guess today we would call it like a style guide right like what's allowed what's not allowed what you know what's the point of, uh, of how this um, depiction is put together okay so this is actually out here and then this is down here and this kind of gray is on the inside on the reference There's some dark, you know, there's some kind of, there's some kind of form going on in there. I can't, you know, the reference image is too small to really see. And uh, then there's these, like, green fluted designs going around here. Let's line up this red a little bit. Just a wee bit. And I want to leave some of those grays in there because that's going to make things pop. Poppity pop. Okay. And I am just going to move that over because I was going to save us a little bit of time. And they are identical. Now we can add those shadow shapes in again, right? So kind of grab that circle, just follow that down there so you can pick that point, kind of make a wedge to that point, following the circle and then down. And that's just the shape that we've got, you know, the, the way that these two shapes intersect here. Okay. I wonder what that is. You know, like I said, I, I thought that was supposed to depict a doorway. But in the reference, it looks like it's uh, perhaps painted and not actually concave in there. And it might just be like a painted 
black, like this painted black there, rather than um, you know, a little cavity in there. It's hard to tell. Reference the reference is just a wee bit uh, lacking in that regard. It's okay though. That's uh, you know I actually kind of like when the reference is not something you've got to perfectly copy. You know. Nice to have some interpretation. Though it is a, um, it is interesting and perhaps sometimes embarrassing when you come back to an image <clears throat> that you were working on uh, and there was uh, maybe a fuzzy reference or something, you know, and then you find a better reference and you realize that uh, you misinterpreted a ton of it, you know, that it's, um, you know, this is not, uh, you know, like that's not a tongue with taste buds and teeth. It's actually, a, you know, a little village with a bunch of people in it or something, you know? And you're like, oh, man. What do I know? I have to unlearn everything I thought I knew. I'm just going to cut these shapes in a little cleaner. There. Maybe he's playing a, a musical instrument or something. That'd be interesting. Just make a total guess there. sure that our hmm. not sure about that okay let's brighten this up see that is significantly brighter in the reference and I'm breaking that line up a little bit there so that it Gives a little more visual interest. Okay. Clean up a little bit here. Soften some of these. Yep, soften that pattern up a little bit. Those don't have to be so. Heavy. Okay, in here. There's some like outside light there, you know, like on the rims. Doesn't have to fade to fade to black on the edges. Man, all these music references. It's like I'm pre-programmed or something. It's just coming out. Okay, let's zoom in on that because I understand that's not going to be fun to look at in a video uh, when you can't see anything. Okay. And it is nice sometimes to build in these little edges here 
you know, will show like this ends, you know, this, uh, this rim comes down and then here we just pop to a different color so that, uh, so that it references that it's a, it is in fact different, if that makes sense. We're using hue to kind of show that form shift there. Hue for a form shift? What is this guy even talking about? Sorry. Just trying to tell you what I'm doing. We'll bump that up just a, just a skosh here. In the reference, the um, it's like it's got a slip, like a uh, ceramic slip on it, and then. Uh, a lot of that wore off over time. That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, and so that is the effect that I want to show there. Just kind of chipped away at that. I'm going to shift this more towards like a purpley blue. Gray. Bring that in there. Oops. And on the other side, there's like a little bit of green there. And I find that a lot of times when I'm working on stuff, I, I tend to shift the yellows more towards red and the greens more towards yellow. Um, depends on your lighting situation, but uh, that can that can actually be a little more believable. Sometimes, sometimes you get in your head what what you think, like what you know to be true about something. Like I was thinking about this, you know, you're you're looking at a hill, uh, looking at a a hill in the distance, and there's all these trees on it, you know, with the fall colors and so forth. And those trees aren't actually you're not actually perceiving the color that you think. You know, you, you look at it and you say, that's yellow. Because you know, you're, you're experienced and smart enough to know that if you were close to that tree, it would be yellow. But if you really stop and squint and look past it and look, to, look at it as not a tree, but as just visual color information in your eye, uh, it's usually not the color that you imagined it to be. It's usually uh, got some other influence, whether that's atmosphere or you know the color of the light, um, you know, something that shifts it away from what you kind of know to be true in your head. It turns out. You are kind of projecting. You're projecting yourself um, to be up close and see it under certain conditions, and those are not always the conditions in which you're actually seeing that thing. So, just something to consider. What is this guy talking about? He's crazy. He's lost his mind. Okay, so we get all this. Let's. Um, 
I suppose we can group the group and then go in with a uh, mask and start just hacking away. That form there. This form comes right like that. Goes there. And it's almost like we're cleaning it up, but we're still leaving it messy. Because that's how we do. This guy right here, straight down there, so that we're kind of letting those form these forms come forward. We can mess this up a little bit here. That's too clean, squeaky clean in there. Squeak, squeak, squeak. And then this here. These go straight up. I didn't actually didn't notice that originally, so I gotta kind of get that messed up. If we go up from there, and then this goes over. That's working so far. Gotta get this in like that. I know this is not very descriptive. Do this, do that, get that in there. Do a little squeaky, squeaky right there. But that's this is what's going on in my head. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, here, tighten that up, and then I'm going to actually reverse it. So I'm going to be bringing bring it back in there. All right, let me zoom out on that. Okay, so then we're going to go. Uh, New layer here, we'll go, uh, I guess we'll just go with overlay. And we're doing this to bring in some hue shifts and uh, some value change. So I'm just darting over at the reference, seeing where I can kind of push and pull things. And then I'm going to switch over to uh, a brighter color here and do it again uh, in the opposite direction. So I'll actually bring things a little brighter. All of these have a little bit of a concave shape, like a bowl shape to them. Um, so they're darker in that top corner where they're, you know, they're the light sources up in the top right, it seems, or maybe top center. But it's nice to just offset it just a little bit. Um, and so that's going to be darker up there on these concave uh, circle shapes and then uh, when we switch over to our brighter color here and uh, I might go I'll go with like a bluish and we'll see how that affects things we might have to change it later but um, Now we're grabbing the underside of these uh, kind of bowl shaped concave circles. Let me switch over, do the dark up top there. I must have forgotten to do it on that one. Okay, and actually, a lot of this is brighter. 
in my reference than I depicted it. I went kind of dark with this. Okay. Now let's go brighter again down this area here. And down at the base of the bowl. Or whatever you want to call that, the base of the sculpture. I don't know why I said bowl. I say bowl a lot. Someone's going to have to psychoanalyze that. And then I'm going to add in underneath all this a uh, shadow. So like we said, our shadow, you know, our light's coming in like this, it appears, perhaps, perhaps more like that, um, almost front on though, because you can see there's, it's pretty softly lit and there's only very little, uh, uh cast shadows. And then around the base, we're going to tighten that up because that's how it goes. Tight around the base, and a little looser if you have a, a broader kind of umbrella light there. Whoops, I am sorry. I just whacked the microphone. That was very unpleasant for everyone, I'm sure. Sorry about that. Never again. That's what they say. You'll never work in this industry again. Keep whacking the microphone. Oh well. Sorry, sir, sorry. Okay. I think this whole thing could use a gradient. You know, I, I, I don't want these values to compete so much, you know, so let me go, let go. Grayish purple. Purplish gray. Whatever you want to turn that. Right, I'm going to start knocking this back. Maybe knock this portion back into the background a little more there. What is he doing? He's lost his mind. Okay. But we're uh, reserving our darkest darks for our areas of, for our focal point. So right now we're just kind of softening this up, pushing things back by uh, getting them closer to that middle gray there. I might just swap colors. I guess I am basically just painting on top of everything. Why not? May as well. When in Rome.
paint like the Romans do. That's how that goes, right? has kind of on the back side of it a little bit of light coming in there what do you need to you gotta, you gotta talk to me here painting what do you want I want a more decisive focal point sir uh oh. It's getting late. The painting's talking to me. Building it up a little, a little stronger in the center. Though this also has a lot of emphasis up here still. Uh, get some more of those greens in there. I think we could clean this up just a bit more. Because it has these interesting little shadow shapes in there. Um, but they're smaller. You know, so this like mouth type form here. there This thing would be set up, but I have a hunch I would not want to run into this when I'm like stumbling through the house to find the bathroom in the middle of the night. You know, it's like around the corner, and here this guy is just looking at you with his tummy out. Like, Bleh. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll be right. I'll be be out of this room very quickly, sir. Don't mind me. So we're just going to start going, going a little bit crazy with this thing. I'm going to add some things that that we don't necessarily see. 
We want to pump it up a bit, right? Because it's not pumped up enough yet. So, add in some, some deep reds. Throw them in kind of at the edge where the uh, shadow transitions into light. Um, I'm going to deepen those reds up there. And maybe transition those these darker reds to uh, the color we get there. To more of a deep purple or something. Yeah, it might be kind of cool. Uh, I suppose that's debatable, depending on who you're talking to, if they consider purple to be a cool, a warm color. I've heard people say that both ways, and I think it's kind of crazy, because uh, it seems kind of seems kind of cool to me. Heresy. Heresy, Eric. You can't say these things. this up here, uh, right on that edge, uh, where else do we want to do that, let's zoom out, I say down here, down here is like screaming, make me more exciting, you know, Eric, Eric, I'm important. Please pay attention to me. That's what this part of the painting is saying right there. A couple of little bippity bops there. And we might actually just throw a little bit of bleed over just because. Draw the eye in there with the kind of bouncing off of that other color. Dropping in a little bit of gray there. And of course, gray is going to help some of those other colors. Sing a little more. Go to this orange here. Actually, you know, I'm just gonna go with like a greeny teal a little bit, just to pop against that right there. Boop, bop. It's kind of like you're taking color theory, and being kind of a punk with it, you know. Making things more exciting than they than they need to be, and this is actually pretty exciting to begin with. That's a tall order. This thing has like, it's like kind of shadow here underneath this, underneath these like little feathers. So it's got a shadow right there. And then that transitions. Let's see, this comes up higher. This little this green stuff. Oh, that's interesting. It like comes around. Up and around. Like boop. Doop doop like that. 
Then you've got another like a new shadow right here between these two parts where they meet. And then a little wedge right there. That's what I'm talking about. Now let's get um let's get some of this value here. Bring it in and around. And tighten that up. We should probably carry this color through, right? So warm that up. Right there. throw in some crazy colors to get this baby popping. We are coming to the end of this. I'm going to do one more thing here. And that's just to bring in a blue, a blue light, like a, an under light here. We're doing this just to exploit form. course we can change the color of this light if we want to. So we're just assuming that there's this light from the bottom left. That's this blue color. And we are painting it in as if it were there. Um, and it, as if it were hitting all of these bottom surfaces, you know, facing that direction. Just using this as a tool to uh, exploit the form. And obviously, we are inventing this portion. This is not actually something that's in the reference.
though. Kudos to the museum if they were to do something like this. They'd have to give me credit though. It's my idea. You didn't invent rim lights, Eric. We want to do all these little guys here? I kind of don't think so. Yeah. Now let's jump back on that. We're almost done here. Yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. All right, and then we might come in and uh, start erasing away some of this stuff. You know, so it's not so clean. Alright, and um, because we're all digital and whatnot, there's a bunch of things we can do. So we can just swap our background around, right? So we can just change this to whatever we feel like. Right, what's gonna what's gonna pop real nicely? That actually is not so bad there. Maybe a little less saturated. Something like that. Okay, and then we can go to our, this is our uh, rim light, right? So, call that a rim light. And um, <clears throat> we can adjust the hue saturation on that. Change that to whatever we want. So if we want this to be, you know, lit a fiery, fiery source below, you know, that'd be kind of cool, or some kind of otherworldly thing with the blue, if we go green or brown, then we're, I mean, we'd have to desaturate it, but then we're in the kind of bounce light region. Like supposing there's grass or dirt on the ground that where uh, that direct sunlight is bouncing up into our uh, model here. There we go. 
And then I'm just going to go ahead and uh, use the, uh, what do we call that guy? Nasty square. And we'll bring in some other elements here. To, actually, we got to change our shadow to be overlay. Give it a second. Go, or multiply rather. Go multiply. Bring that back. Yeah, something like that. All right. And we're here with our big brass. And all we're really doing here is we're just adding in a textural background. full screen um, here's what I'm going to do I'm going to go uh, duplicate that layer now I've got my uh, smudge brush and I'm just going to mess that up a little bit so that it's not this uh, complete repetition of that same um, brush head Almost looks like it's like uh, smoke you know, coming out of the coming out of thing. I don't know if that's how it works. I don't think there's any portion in there that seems to. I mean, unless that dark spot in the middle, maybe that's what that is. Maybe that's a little area where the it's charred or something. But you'd have to see evidence of that, I guess, in the in the uh, in the artifact. So I'm painting behind it, and you can see how it's you know, making these real subtle changes to the, you know, to the uh, painting because there's still areas where the texture has allowed some you know, pass through.
like I said, we are uh, we are near the end. I know I keep saying that, and then I keep going, and that's kind of probably something you've gotten used to if you watch these streams. But um, yeah, I think we're about there, and uh, I'm probably gonna do a um, color balance on this. Let's see if we can eke out a little more with that, you know, um, partly what happens is, you know, you end up staring at this thing forever, and you, uh, you, uh, get acclimated to the colors in front of you, and so a color balance helps you kind of reset, head back in a direction that might be more engaging, more interesting, you know. That's interesting. I do like that really, really warm uh, feel to that, you know. You're really um, changing the palette at this point, you know. It's kind of like doing a wash or something, you know, or a glaze. Yeah, you can see that pushes things quite a bit further. And you can do them separately for your background, too. You know, you could do another, do color balance in the background where we maybe cool things off a little bit, send them away from that purple and maybe more towards, you know, blues and greens. I do like the idea of this being a little more gray, though, so maybe, uh, maybe I will hit it with a, um, hue saturation layer and bring it down in value, or in, uh, saturation. I like how um, this gets close to homogenized, but then I think it just needs to be less, just less. I might swing this below the fire. There we go. We switch this just to color. So to look at the difference here, we go color, and we go up to normal. Let's see how much of an effect that has. And maybe over the whole thing, we just do. Uh, you know, just kind of blend all these values together. Lose the lose the base. Lose some of these, these 
background pieces a little bit here. We'll see how this goes. We might knock this, this back a little bit. But we're just trying to diminish some of these uh, features. Bring our color balance back in. We're just, just playing with the background to get some more atmosphere. So that's what we had. That's what we dropped in. Let's bring this down below our group. Let's see. Maybe below the rim light. Nice to bring back in some of those elements that we uh, that we played with. Okay, we could probably do more. Um, but I think this is probably sufficient. Uh, as he keeps going. Yeah, that's probably a good place to stop. All right, so got a little crazy with this one. Um, but that's kind of what I do. Uh, this was a fun exercise with just so much color on this and all these little interesting details and um, you know these associated shapes that keep popping up, you know, the circles and the little arrowheads and the blocks and so forth. Um, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Um, well, thanks for joining in tonight and following along. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope that you were um, painting along with uh, you know, one of your own projects. And um, if you uh, are interested in the brushes that I used, um, that should be in the description, or you can just check them out on my art station. Um, I released most of my brushes. I still have a few more um, packs that I want to get out. Um, but they're all brushes that I um, have developed over over the years and have been using. Um, and if you are interested in uh, Fantastic Tanks, that's one of the main projects that I've been working on uh, lately, go to fantastictanks.com. We'll be launching the site soon, and um, there's going to be some, uh, some pretty cool and exciting stuff with that. So... Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in seeing more, check those things out. Um, you can 
go to my Eric Well Art Station account, or um, if you're interested in the specific Fantastic Tanks branded stuff, um, go check that out because uh, that's got some exciting developments around the corner. Uh, so, all right, thank you for joining in tonight, and uh, have a great night.